chapter 3, starting at verse 16, very familiar portion of scripture, hallelujah, I was blessed this week to be able to go away for a couple days after Wednesday night service, we just went up to Orlando, the family, for a few days, and uh, it was a lot of fun because I woke up the next day sick. Hallelujah. So I enjoyed a little three-day vacation, sick and unable to do anything fun. Hallelujah. But God is still good. Hallelujah. Yeah. So still feeling it here today. I'm not going to be very long this afternoon, probably. Uh, but God's will be done. Amen. John chapter 3, starting at verse 16, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Right. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth come cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Hallelujah. I wonder for more time before we're seated. Close our eyes, lift our hands, and get connected with God and ask him to have his will in this place that he would minister to us. Let's go ahead. Lord, I thank you for what you're already doing here. I thank you, Lord, for what I already feel in this place. Lord. And I pray, God, that your will would be done right now, Lord. That it would be your spirit ministering to us, God. I am nothing, Lord. I am just a vessel. I pray that you do as you see fit today, God. heart and heart be softened right now Lord. Soften to your word and to your spirit Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You can go ahead and be seated. Hallelujah. There's a Greek word being omnis. And I'm asking the question today. I forgot to say this. <laughs> Thank you brother, brother Jessica. <laughs> the question I'm asking today is does God always get what he wants? That may seem like a silly question, uh, but I pray that it makes sense in a little bit. But there's a Greek word, omnis, which we use uh, in putting together with other words, being omni. And when you put omni together and you, you put it with, you, with uh, um, you get omniscient, basically omni means all, everything, all that there is to have. And the word omniscient means all-knowing. That there is knowing of everything that there is to know. Now, you may be thinking right now in your mind of what that means. Trust me, you're not even coming close to what that really means. I'm not talking about getting a good education or reading a lot of books 
All knowing is to know every single thing that there could possibly be to know. Yes. It's all knowing, meaning they knows what time somebody woke up on March 7th, 1901. Out of nowhere for no reason that whatsoever. You could read every book that there is that has been written. You could speak to every person that has ever lived. You could be alive at every time that there has ever been. You would still not be all-knowing. Right, but the Bible talks about our God as being all-knowing and omniscient. Amen. David makes it very personal but still very large when he talks about it in Psalm chapter 139. Verse 1, he says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Amen. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Amen. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest me my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all of my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Amen. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain to it. Job chapter 42, he says that there is no thought that you do not know. Our God is absolutely all knowing. He knows every single thing that there is to know. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows what happened last week. He knows what's going to happen next year. Even Jesus himself says in Luke 12, chapter, chapter 12, verse 7, that even the hairs of your head are numbered. He knows how many hairs there are in this room right now. He knows how many air molecules there are filling this place right now. Our God knows absolutely every single thing that there is to know. Nothing is beyond his understanding. Amen. The Bible also refers to him as being omnipresent, meaning everywhere all at once. He is present in every country this morning. He is present in every city, in every town, in every home, in every building, in every church. He is present there right now. Hallelujah. Amen. David goes on in that very same chapter, picking right up in verse 7. He says, if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed even in hell, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee, for thou hast possessed my reins, and thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Amen. Not only is our God all-knowing, not only does he know and understand and uh, comprehend every single thing that there is to know, but he is everywhere all at once. He's with that random person that I said back in 1901 or whatever. He is everywhere all at once. He does not, he is not restrained to time such as we are. Right. Right. He's not waking up this morning starting a day. Right now, God is creating the universe for you and I. Right now, he's there when Jesus is coming back to receive his church. Right now, he's there parting the waters for Moses. Right now, he's there setting up the mouths of the lions for Daniel. He is everywhere all at once. There is not a place that he is not there. He dwells in all of time and in all of space because he is an almighty spirit that cannot be contained. He knows exactly what you're going through here today. He knows exactly what kind of things you're battling in your mind here today where you haven't told anybody else and you think you've got it a secret and nobody can ever figure it out. God already knows where you are. He's already there with you. He was there with you last night as you lay down in confusion. He was with you this morning when you woke up feeling alone. He knows where you are and he's there with you. But he doesn't just know everything. 
And he isn't just everywhere. But in order to do those things, in order to know all things, in order to be everywhere at once, he would have to contain great power. In the Bible, in Revelation 19 and 6, John says, I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. He is omnipotent, meaning all powerful. Not only does he know what's going on in your life, not only was he there when everything fell apart, not only will he be there later on when life gets tough, not only will he be there and know how to get you out, but he's got the power to get you out. He's got the power to set you free. He's got the power to deliver you, to heal you, to bring you out of your depression. He has all power. We're not serving a God that we just call on to make us feel better. This is the God that spoke light into existence. He didn't invent a light bulb. He just said, let there be light. And where there was no light, then all of a sudden the lights came on. That's the power that we are serving right now. That's the power of the God that we serve. When he spoke, I want there to be a universe, out of nowhere there it was a universe. When he spoke, I want the waters to part so that the children of Israel can go across. The waters parted and the children of Israel went across. He is everywhere and he is all-knowing, but he's also all-powerful. Hallelujah. 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 And sometimes we can think that probably a God that powerful must just be in control of everything. He must have control over everything if he's that powerful. If he truly knows everything. If he's truly in every terrible situation that goes on in this world and he has the power, he must be in control of everything. But I'm sorry to tell you today, and I don't mean to demean God in any way, but he doesn't have power over everything. He doesn't have the power over everything in this world. Because the one thing that God truly wants that the Bible lets us know many times The one thing that God really truly wants more than anything else, more than the gold on a thousand hills, more than all the blessed, all the financial things you can have in the world, more than any stature or any lordship, what our God truly wants is you. What our God, the all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful, creator of the world wants more than anything else is you. He did not create the universe because he wanted a universe. He created it because he wanted you. He did not create the oceans and the land and the light because he could. He did it because he wanted you. He did not form man out of the mud of the earth and his breath because he wanted to see if he could do it. He did it because he wanted you. Everything that he has done, he has done because he wanted you. And don't get me wrong. I'm talking to myself as well. But everything that he has done Everything that he has created, all of the great powerful things we see throughout the Bible, especially in the Old Testament and the healings and miracles that went on in the New Testament church. All of it was not so God could prove how powerful he is. He's the most powerful being in the universe. Nobody even comes close to him. He's got nothing to prove. He did it because he wants you. If he truly wanted to, he could have created a world full of robots that would be perfect and never do anything wrong and make all the right decisions and do everything perfectly. But he didn't want perfection. He wants you. He wants me. 
He didn't ask for perfection. He just asked for your heart. He just asked that all who would to come to him. The love that our God possesses for us cannot even be imagined. It cannot be contained. It cannot even be described truly as great as it is because as humans, flawed humans, we don't understand that kind of love. The closer we get to him, the closer we get to it. But his love for us goes so far beyond all the love that we have for our children, all the love that we have for our spouse, all the love that we have for our parents, all the love that God has for us goes way beyond all of that stuff. He did everything that he's done because he wants you to be with him. That's love. He showed me mercy and grace every time that I spit in his face because he loved me. Because he wanted me. Jesus says in John chapter 10 verse 10, that the thief, our enemy, take that as you will. It could be the devil, sin, our flesh. Those are all our enemies. Those are thieves that come. And he said that thief is only coming to steal from you, to kill you, and to destroy everything that you have. The last few weeks, every time I've been up here, it feels like talking about sin and I'm sorry for that if you don't like it but I feel the Lord has led me to this today sin is not your friend those things that you find pleasure in right now that is not your friend it does not care about you it does not love you it does not want you all it wants to do is to steal from you to kill you and to destroy your family and destroy everyone around you but Jesus said that's what the thief comes to do but I've come that you might have life and that you might not just have life, but that you would have life more abundantly. Ask the question, does God always get what he wants? Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But he is long-suffering to us where, meaning he's patient with us. All the times that we go the opposite way, he's there, patient with us, long-suffering with us, telling us, I'm not giving up on you, I'm not going anywhere, I'm not walking away, nothing you can do will push me away, I will always be here with you, because he is patient with us. Because he's long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. Amen. I'm sorry to say here that God does not always get what he wants. Now I know, I know he knows all things and he knows the end and he knows what's going to be and all of that. But we've still got to make the choice. To join up and team up with the thief that wants to steal from us. To kill us and to destroy us. Or to join together with the one that is offering life. People say his will, he's God, his will's always done. I'm sorry, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says his will is that all of us would come to repentance. All of us would come to him. And every time he sits there and it's... He's by us, and I can see in my mind and thinking an image of God just standing next to each and every one of us with his hands held out with life and joy and love and peace right there in his hands saying, please take this from me. Please come to me. Please let me give this to you. But unfortunately, too many times we slap his hands away and we turn around and say, I'm going to go my way. But he never leaves. The hands that are slapped away are quickly picked. 
pick right back up and offer to us once again. Here is life. Here's life more abundantly. I don't want to just help you not be in sin. I want to give you a better life than you ever could have had. I don't want you to just feel better about yourself. I want you to have the best life you can have. So he offers again and again to us. Our sin will condemn us. Put a feeling of condemnation that we are too bad to come to God. We are too messed up. We've made too many mistakes to come back to Jesus. But he said, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In verse 19, he says, this is the condemnation. That condemnation that we have that condemns us to hell. It's not God's grace coming, but it's that light. And a better translation is actually the light. Right. Jesus, the light, is coming to the world. But instead of turning to him and the life that he is offering, men turn to darkness instead. That's the only condemnation when we choose something else other than God. Yeah. But when we choose God and we choose life with him, there is no condemnation. There is only open arms as the father to the prodigal son. As the son walked up that driveway, we think that God's closing all the shades and locking the doors saying, you're not welcome here. But what the father did when he saw his son coming, he ran out the door and ran down the driveway and embraced his son. That's what God does for us. He's all powerful. There's no sin that's too great for him. There's no lifestyle that's too great for him. There's no decision that God can't fix and God can't turn around. All we've got to do is accept the life that he's trying to give us. Hallelujah. He goes on to say in verse 20, Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, Lest his deeds should be reproved or exposed is another word for that. Don't, they don't come to the light. Maybe because they're afraid that their lifestyle is going to be exposed. It says, lest his deeds be reproved. And other translations put it in a way that would say it as because they're afraid that they would be exposed. They're afraid that all this stuff would come about. They're afraid of the punishment even. They're afraid of what will have to happen to them if they dare let out the things that are in their heart. But he says that he that doeth truth cometh to the light. That his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Let me tell you, God's not interested in squashing you because of the sins in your life. God is wanting to embrace you and help you to get over the sins in your life and to work with you that your deeds can be made manifest through God. That God can show how great he is through you. How's God going to show how great he is through you if all he does is kick you while you're down? That's not the God that we serve. He wants to lift you up. He wants to bless you. He wants you to have that life more abundantly. Oh, Jesus. Glory to God. He's God here today. He's in the seat next to you. My God, my God. He's in the row next to you. He's in the hallway next to you. With his arms extended out. Yes, Lord. With life in his hands. With hope in his hands. With peace and joy in his hands. And he's saying, please, come to me. John 7, 37 says, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. They were in a fast at that time. They had actually been fasting water for the feast. And Jesus said that I 
in the true living water. He says in verse 38, he that believeth on me as the scripture saith. The Bible says a lot, believe on Jesus. We read it in, in, in our text today that, to the, that the world might through him might be saved, that they that believe upon him might be saved. And that is very true. We must believe that Jesus is our Savior. We must believe that he has come to save us and to deliver us. But that is not where the Bible stops. He, Jesus said, he that believeth on me, as the scripture saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And this he spake of the spirit which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. I, I, I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't know who's here and who has got what, history, what your history is like. But if you've gone somewhere where you've claimed, I believe that Jesus is my Savior. That's great. That's a great first step. But that is not the true life that Jesus has for you. He has so much more for you than that. But he said that all should come to repentance. And Peter said in Acts 2.38 that we repent and be baptized in Jesus' name. And then we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said that we believe on him through his word. Out of our bellies will flow rivers of living water. That's the Holy Ghost. That's the life more abundantly. Yeah, you can have a better life trying to live for God. But a life more abundantly is when really we join with this spirit. And he fills us. That's a life more abundantly. Many of you know my history. And I'm almost done. I'm getting to the point where I can't talk very much. Many of you know my history, and, and I've said it from up here many times, how I struggled with sin and addiction to pornography and sin for a long time. And I would try and try. And I even went online and got so many different programs to try to help me to get over it, to stop uh, giving in to my sins and all of this stuff. And I tried so many times and I made so many promises. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going back into this place anymore. I'm not going to be bound by this anymore. But yet when I would leave, I would not let his spirit lead me. I would leave a powerful altar call and go right back into sin. But when I decided not just to receive in an altar call, but I decided to let my his life come to me. When I I decided to let myself be with him every day when I decided to give myself fully to him and all of the things I didn't want to give up and all of the things I didn't want to start when I decided to let him have my life completely all that power came into my life and it broke the chains of addiction and it destroyed the yoke that was once upon me and it tore down every wall that I couldn't get through on my own there is power for you when you come to Jesus. Let's go ahead and stand. Hallelujah. Whatever you're struggling with, whatever you're going through today, whatever you're going God knows it. As hard as it is to think about it, he was there when it was committed. Because he's everywhere. He was there in every difficult moment. And he knows exactly the thoughts that you're thinking right now. Thoughts of, I can't go through with this. I can't really do this. I, I think it's great what he's saying, but I don't know if I could change all of this. I don't know if I could go through with this. It's not about making commitments up here and what you need to change and all of that. It's just letting Jesus come to you with that new life. As we walk out daily and we walk and we pray and we read our Bible, God will begin to stir the stuff out of us. Don't, worry, don't let that keep you from coming to him right now because what he wants to give you is a better life than what you're living right now. He wants to give you a better life than the depression that you're dealing with, the anger in your heart, the things that you are hurting by, that being hurt with, the things that you are struggling with. God, that's something so much better for you. 
So why don't we today, I don't mean to be silly, but why don't we give God what he wants today? Because what he wants is you. What he wants is you with all of your imperfections, all of your mistakes, all of your addictions, all of your terrible thoughts, all of those terrible, disgusting things that nobody else knows about that you don't want to talk about. He already knows about them, and he's still inviting you to him. Because all he wants is you.